Hey, how's it going, everybody? This is The Last Coffee House. We are continuing this part two, Coddling of the American Mind by... Uh-oh, I forgot the... <laughs> I don't have him in front of me. I know Jonathan Haidt, but I keep... Lenikoff? Leniakoff? I don't know, it's going to be somewhere, so sorry about that other author, but uh, we've got the content. What kind of content? We're still trying to understand what's going on with students today. That's what the book is mainly about. And what back into more contents here. Anxiety and depression. So the book talks about this case study wherein this guy was suicidal, suffered severe anxiety and depression, and then went through cognitive behavioral therapy, something we brought up in the first part, and it saved his life. And now he goes around and talks, even with Jonathan Hyde, I think they went in tandem. Um, and wrote a paper or something like that. But he goes around and helps people try to deal with this using really simple kinds of therapies that don't require, you know, a bunch of medication or institutionalization or anything like that. But that's cognitive behavioral therapy, and a lot of that has to do with the stuff that we, we have talked about and we will talk more about as we go along. When it comes to anxiety and depression, girls are more affected, and now we're in the internet generation, and you have internet in your pocket, so it's a whole different world from what a lot of people grew up with. Kids are tending to grow up much more slowly now, which is a little counterintuitive. You would think they have more information at their fingertips. Maybe it's just overwhelming, <laughs> but they would be able to grow up a little faster. They'd get information faster and be able to do that. But they are slower to life events now, so major life events that most people go through eventually, they are taking more time to get to the, to the those things. There are much higher rates of anxiety and depression and much higher rates of suicide and all those things increasing in tandem. And there's a heavy correlation, and this is something that is pretty shocking. I think there was, what was the other book that we read? Oh, Irre Irreversible Damage. Yeah, I think that was it. The one that was about girls and the clustering of transgenderism and that, that kind of a thing. So in that, they talked about this too. But it's, it's the heavy correlation between anxiety, depression, suicide, and the use of electronic devices. So the rise of electronic devices and what came with that social media has a heavy correlation with the rise in anxiety depression and suicide so kids today apparently and you know when I was a kid we were outside all the time we were constantly outside I played video games you know I watched TV I watched movies all that stuff but we spent so much time outside doing whatever random stuff just playing freeze tag or <laughs> basketball or whatever but apparently kids today they do far less of that you know it's a lot of device usage a lot of TV watching and things like sports and church and reading that's the big one reading and the main reason I'm doing anything <laughs> on any platform is trying to get people to read again but sports, church, reading, they all have an inverse correlation to anxiety, depression, and suicide. So if you engage in those, and obviously this is correlation, this is not causation, but I'm saying it in this way. But if you engage in those things in sports, in church, in reading, and other things like it, then you are far less likely to have high rates of anxiety or depression or have them at all, and far less likely to commit or attempt to commit suicide. So again, it's not a necessar necessarily some causative thing here where, okay, if I attend sports, then suddenly my anxiety and everything's going to go down. It's not necessarily causative, but those things definitely correlate. Ways of aggression, this is an interesting point, ways of aggression between boys and girls on a broad scale, obviously, are different. So when it comes to boys, they engage in more physical aggressive <laughs> tendencies. So they'll attack each other, and I'm, I can definitely attest to that. That was one of our primary occupations as, as kids. But they physically attack each other, whereas girls tend to attack each other relationally <laughs> or psychologically. <laughs> or attack people's reputations, they had to figure out different strategies to be able to get out that aggression. And they did it in those kinds of ways. Well, one of the offshoots of that is that boys can escape the kind of violence that they're used to having to engage in. So the things that they're threatened with, the physical violence, you can escape that. You can run away. But girls can't escape the kinds of aggression that they engage in by just running away. They have computers now in their pockets where they're going to see this aggression. They're going to see these attacks to their reputation or relational aggression or other kinds of psychological aggression. That stuff they're not going to be able to get away from. Now, obviously, Anybody can knock and say, uh, hello, uh, you can turn off the phone. <laughs> but still, it's one of those things. It's what kids do. But it's a really interesting dichotomy that men, boys, have the ability to be able to escape the kind of thing that they perceive as aggression, whereas girls and women have less ability to be able to escape those things. Safetyism is bad, so just protecting everybody, overprotecting everybody for the sake of overprotecting everybody is bad. You have to look at the objective facts that are going on around this stuff. 
and you end up with this learned helplessness and that's what a lot of our students are exhibiting nowadays is this learned helplessness where they work their way because of the way they're treated the way they're brought up whatever into being helpless when they're, they're not helpless when they <laughs> they can learn to deal with all this kind of stuff but they get coddled so much that they have this learned helplessness confirmation bias obviously is super important for anything when you're talking about humans and what humans do and why they do it confirmation bias is a big deal and this is another thing that comes up when it comes to all these kids trying to say that oh we need this or we need that less than two hours per day so if you have a device if you're on devices on social media less than two hours per day it seems like it has no bad effects so you could have a child or something like that who wants to be able to engage in this kind of kind of stuff if they're limited to less than two hours per day it doesn't seem to have negative effects on that and uh, you know huge bibliography huge endnotes all this stuff you know it's cite citations everywhere uh, I didn't go through each one of the citations I don't have 10 years to be able to go through this one book but so it's good it's good to have those things if you need to look them up 2013 to 2017 tellingly this is the ri the arrival of iGen and remember iGen is generation Z right so they're the ones who really first had direct access to the internet you know from the beginning and they arrived in college 2013 to 2017 and 2013 2017 is when we started seeing all this crazy nonsense about safe spaces and deplatforming people and speech is violence and all this other stuff. So, so that's what we're running into <laughs> headlong. This is what we're running into. Paranoid parenting. So we had this we have this idea of free range kids. That's something that's kind of coming up is letting your kids have a, a little bit of space on that leash to be able to be kids. And one thing I thought about uh, as an analogy is a sports tournament. So if you imagine that if you're raising kids they're going to have a sports tournament coming up. So at the end of, of their being raised, they're going to have to play in the sports tournament. And if you sequester them, don't let them play the sport because they could get injured in it. <laughs> And then you just throw them out into the sports tournament. It's not going to go well. So uh, that's one thing that you need to be able to do. And that's one thing that they do by doing all the things that we'll talk about, you know, coming along. I love they have this one chapter that's specifically just about here are all the things that we should be doing. This is this is all the stuff that's going to reverse all this craziness. That's great. That's great. And wonderful. But so kids nowadays are at an actual objective low risk when it comes to, you know, historically. And the authors say we need to relax and let children be children. And moderate stress helps coping skills. So not extreme stress, but moderate stress will help them be able to deal with stress in the future. And just like with the peanuts that we talked about before, if you completely sequester them from stressors, they're not going to be able to deal with it in the future. And the untruths, of course, the oracle three great untruths that were talked about before, the ones about emotional being emotional and us versus them and whatever doesn't kill me makes me weaker, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. We have to get rid of those untruths. The decline of play. Experience is vital, especially for children. They have to have the experience of the thing to really learn about it. Rough and tumble play, really important. Outdoor physical play has declined the most when it comes to how children spend their time now. And we have less competent kids and more risk averse kids. And then that is reflected within the education system. The bureaucracy of safetyism. And this is, it becomes <laughs> bureaucratized. I'm gonna make up a couple of words as we go along. So campus administrators, they end up using cognitive distortions and modeling distorted thinking for the students when they get to college. So they'll use things like we talked about, the, like the catastrophizing, and they'll reinforce that kind of thinking or emotional reasoning or whatever. They'll reinforce that kind of thinking to their students and won't get checked on that nonsense. <laughs> and then we have overreaction to things that are meager slights. Like I, I don't think they use this term because they probably stayed desperately away from it, away from it. But something like misgendering, an overreaction to that, or making a stupid post on a social media website from a professor or something like that. There's overreaction and then there's uh, overregulation. So like there was this one story about a daughter of a professor who was wearing a Game of Thrones shirt that said something you know untoward, something a little hostile or something like that. And the professor got into trouble. It's ridiculous. And there's overregulation like speech, common target nowadays. And you have things like free speech zones, so it's not that you just have free speech and they can't infringe upon that, but then they try to box you in and say, okay, only at this time, at this place is where you can just sit by yourself and, and say to your heart's content whatever you want to say. <laughs> But some professors even talked about, there was one law professor, I think, who was talking about how she had to give up on certain topics because there there was such an outcry related to trigger warnings uh, when she was just trying to discuss criminal law and specifically rape law and how, 
you know, that has evolved over time and all that. And she wasn't, she had to just drop it, eventually just give up this topic because it was causing so many issues. That is not a good way to approach <laughs> having intellectually mature people out there. That's not a way to do that. And of course, victimhood culture is just something that's been on the dramatic rise thanks to the bureaucracy of safetyism. The question, I put the question for, is it the quest for justice or the question for justice? I don't know if my fingers just filled in that word automatically. <laughs> the question, quest for justice, we'll say. How birth year influences political views. Uh, so depending on what generation you're born in, what er era of time you're born in, there's this little pocket of liberals, and I forget which specific years, but apparently you're the most impressionable until 24. So up until 24, that's when you're the most impressionable, and then you start to congeal into whatever you're going to be after that. But there are some pockets where you'd have have different political things going on, you know, like civil rights, like Vietnam or whatever, that are going to impact who you're going to be politically. And so whatever year you're born in, if that stuff came around, then that's going to that's gonna hit you hard and define who you are thereafter. Then the authors want to make sure that everybody knows that they're liberals. So it's like, we're cool, guys. We're cool, really. We're part of the club. And then talk about some stuff about, and we go a little askew here, where we start talking about full racial equality and um, asking what social justice is. And of course, there's a whole bunch of craziness around this. I'm sure we've touched on it a little bit in some other books, uh, when we discussed other books at least, but I'm going to get too deep into it here. But they ask what is social justice and kind of try to define it based on what people perceive it as, which I think is a good process here. So they, they bring up how young kids want a fair reward, which is great. You know, that's probably something that's pretty standard and pretty stable when it comes to memes that kids are working off of, no matter how much they try to deny it when it comes to uh, broader things. Just like that one, I saw a video where the kids were asked about socialism and the kids were all like, yeah, socialism is great, it's wonderful. Um, and then the reviewer or the interviewer said, okay, well, so do you have good grades? So if you have good grades, why don't you just give some of your grades to somebody who doesn't have good grades? And then they're like, like, oh, well, I worked for that, so I don't want to do it. So I think once you get down to the nitty gritty, then a lot of these ideas are going to be, you know, very well established and we don't have to worry too much. It's just in big numbers. They just, and when it's distant, you know, somewhere off, then they don't really have the same concept of it. But kids tend to prefer fair inequality over unfair equality. It's, you know, that's an important concept. There's a whole lot of stuff that you can go into based on that, but that's what they tend to prefer. And then proportionality or merit is the most approved. So uh, whatever you put in is what you get back kind of a thing. Kids mostly uh, approve of that. And they love procedural justice. So uh, when they want to be able to see that the process to decision is fair, which is, again, very good. Even though they decry all of these things, all these kids on the streets who are protesting, they decry all of these things to some degree. And then, yeah, I think they, they tossed in, okay, we hold the view that everyone deserves the same economic, political, and social rights and opportunities. Insanity. I mean, to just even begin to start defining any of these things and how we're going to make sure that everybody has the same of all of those things is just pure insanity. Inebriated, high, just all the things. <laughs> It's, no, you, there's no way on earth you're going to be able to define those things and then force society to have equal whatever based on those things. You get legal equality, that's what you get. So then we have, there's this, there's a phrase where they talk about how some injustices are subtle. And I really wish we'd stop talking in these kind of mealy terms about this. If it's subtle, it's not an injustice. Jesus Christ, if it's subtle, it's something that's like an annoyance. Anyway, and then we have this very telling passage here uh, where uh, they were trying to explain something about uh, systemic racism or racial injustice in general and how, like, democracies work and all that and saying that, okay, if you had a high school where you have musical tastes that were based on race and you had all the white students, if it's a majority white school and all the white students vote for their music and all the black students vote for their music, then the black students are never going to have their music played, you know, at the prom or whatever. And this is really emblematic because it's the kind of thing, it assumes a monolith. Now, obviously, this is just a... Uh a thought experiment, but it, it assumes a monolith, and this is exactly the problem. Quite obviously, different students are going to have different interests, and it's not going to specifically scale based on race. Otherwise, race is some kind of a significant factor that we actually do need to take into consideration. Black people and white people are not monoliths. They are individuals that get to pick whatever they're going to pick based on their own preferences. So, But this is the kind of thing that comes out all over the place when it comes to leftists, especially, and liberals in general, where they want to make people 
people based on their race into a monolith. Now, even if there are greater rates of X or Y within this, this or that population based on the race, it is still, as part of the social contract that we have established in the United States, the still, still the entire point is that you don't treat people on that basis. You don't say that, oh, well, you have that skin color, you must like R&B. You don't get to do that. And they just kind of gloss right over, you know, all the other implied ideas based on this. And I remember talking to another liberal who actually, uh, she worked for Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> and, uh, and I was trying to, we were going over this whole race question, and I'm just trying to explain, okay, every step of the way, you are treating somebody differently on the basis of their race, and she would try to attribute something to them, just saying that, oh, well, they must have had this kind of experience, or they, they must want this sort of thing, or know this sort of thing, or whatever, and I was saying that, no, that's exactly the wrong way to do it. It's exactly wrong to start treating people differently, or come up to somebody differently, or think about them differently, or consider them differently on the basis of their skin color. That's exactly the problem. But it's the liberal modus operandi. Major problem. So, uh, ads, principal need for democracies is to protect minorities. Yes, that's why we have the structure that we have. Protect minority opinions, protect uh, minority groups, whatever. They need to be protected. They cannot be steamrolled by the majority. That's one of the major functions of, of the way that we're structured. Then there's a mention of equal outcomes, social justice. I think this was in opposition to it. I can't remember. I, don't, I can't imagine that, uh, you know, obviously I have these notes. I have long notes, and I just try to give myself little points here, but uh, I can't imagine they would say that equity that equal equality of outcome is something that we should be aspiring to. I think they is explicitly talked about how there are differences, maybe this was a talk I was listening to, but there are differences in people's abilities and intelligence and attractiveness and all this other stuff. So there's you're not going to be able to nullify all those things, and you shouldn't want to, obviously. The interest in team sports has declined, and this that's the one thing. The sports teams are insane right now. It's unbelievable the posturing that we're getting from things like the NBA, but you really want kids to be interested in team sports. It's something they should be doing so they can learn all sorts of stuff about being a person. The use of leisure time is different in informal situations, so the way that they use their leisure time nowadays is, is much different from what it used to be. I wish I remembered all the details of that. I think there was something interesting in there, but anyway. the out Yeah, here we go. Okay, so they said the outcome gap is a correlation. They're specifically saying it's a correlation that does not mean it's causation. You have to look much more deeply into it before you can say that, oh, it must be injustice or something like that. And then, oh, right, so then they go right into being on the right side of history and then bringing up incarceration and police brutality as obvious signs of uh, racial inequity or something like that, which is uh, ludicrous on the face. I mean, obviously, 90% of the people who are incarcerated are men, just like 90% of the people who suffer police brutality are men. So you wouldn't say that, obviously, uh, those are the most sexist institutions in the history of the world, and we need to get on top of that to make sure that it's 50-50 men and women that are being incarcerated and suffering police brutality. There are other considerations that you need to make and you need to control for before you start saying that it's injustice. And the people that I've seen who have actually controlled for those kinds of things, like Roland Fryer at Harvard, have actually found that it is not a racial disparity. There isn't a racial disparity when you put in the proper controls. And that it is uh, at least a little, not even just a little anymore, it's it's irresponsible nowadays to just kind of throw those kinds of things out there like incarceration and police brutality as some kind of racial injustice. It's incredibly irresponsible and something that people need to be honest about and stop inflaming this kind of fear-mongering nonsense. Okay, wiser kids, so we get some uh, some guides here, guides on what we need to do. And thank you very much, authors, for giving us some positive takeaways from this stuff. So wiser kids, free play, important. Don't intervene in small conflicts, important. Because <laughs> I'm sure as parents, you just want to jump in and stop any kind of a situation that's going on. But you want to give your kid a chance to deal with these kind of conflicts on their own and not be coddled in that way. Trial and error is a better teacher than didactically explaining to somebody what something is. This is something that all of us need to learn from time to time. You need, the kids need to be dosed with risk. It's very important. Things like biking to school by themselves can be a big deal. Now, obviously, any parent is going to be concerned about their physical safety, the kid's physical safety, so you have to take that kind of stuff into account. But to the extent that you can, you should err on the side of giving your kid more space so they have a chance to do these kinds of things. Find other kids to play with so they have these chances. Productive disagreement, cultivate that. Very 
very important, you know, whether it's over the dinner table or it's with other kids or at school or whatever. Cultivate productive dis disagreement. Argue as if you're right, but listen as if you're wrong. If everybody could learn that. Now, that's very hard for me to, uh, obviously, w whether I'm arguing or listening, I think I'm absolutely right about everything. So, so that's tough. I understand, but it's, it's a good pearl. The basics of CBT, really important. Like the doom thoughts we talked about before when you're having doom thoughts that are scary things that could lead to bad things, then give them a funny voice. <laughs> that's one of the procedures that's used in CBT and apparently works very well. Realize that the line dividing good and evil is in the hearts of every human. It's not that it divides between humans. It's in the hearts of every human, the good and evil. Brings up Solzhenitsyn. I cannot wait to read his book, The Gulag Archipelago. I've got it next to my bed. I just have so many other things going on. I haven't gotten to read it yet. But Solzhenitsyn specifically talks about, you know, he criticized Stalin. He ended up in a gulag. And he talks about how he could have been an executioner. He, like, applied for a job that ended up being an executioner. Uh, and he saw the fine line between those two things. And this idea of the feeling of being wrong. I think they asked what the feeling of being wrong was. And then everybody thinks, oh, yeah, I hate feeling wrong. But... Uh, uh, realize that even when you're wrong a lot of the time you'll be wrong for like months <laughs> without being corrected and you don't feel anything bad about it it just feels perfectly fine but once you find out then you have a different feeling so it's it's not really the feeling of being wrong it's the feeling of realizing that you've been wrong common humanity versus common enemy identity politics so i think we should get identity politics out of everything but they're talking about common humanity bringing people together versus common enemy bringing people together you know one of them healthy one was not homework should be pretty minimal in early grades you need a lot of time for kids to be out playing playing with other kids learning stuff by trial and error rather than doing homework more recess and less supervision. In New Zealand, they actually have this schools. I don't know if it's all the schools, but some of the schools at least, or at least one, <laughs> has recess with no supervision whatsoever. There are no adults around at all. Uh, they just let the kids out. And that can foster that kind of healthy conflict and growth. Obviously, they put in a whole bunch of extra things to make sure the kids are, are safe enough. And they counsel the kids ahead of time that you need to be nice to other kids and all that. But they let them. They just let them go out there, no supervision, and let them do whatever they're going to do. Structure Structured formal debates, yes, 100%. Every kid that I've ever known who has gone through structured debate has been a much better kid than all the other kids who haven't. <laughs> Everybody should do structured formal debate. Every single school should require it. Uh, the public speaking aspect, the arguing against somebody aspect, whether you believe the actual proposition or not, absolutely everybody should do that. Uh, media literacy classes, I can't remember the particulars of that, but it sounds good to me. Difference between evidence and opinion, what? Yes, have some more of that. Thank you. On Liberty by Mill. Yes, absolutely. Every single high school student should read On Liberty at least twice, maybe 25 times. So yeah, for sure. Limits on devices, two hours per day and not during school. It'd be great if we could enforce this, if this could be a thing. I, I'm sure there are some private schools that are able to do this that make kids, you know, like give up their, their devices when they get to school or something like that. But I, I don't know. Protect sleep. Sleep's really important. Service or work before college as new national norm. Yes, 100% behind this. I honestly think at this point that we should have mandatory military service. I think in the United States, we should have mandatory military service. I think we should, right after high school and before you go off to college or work or whatever, I think you should have to do mandatory military service, for sure. But even just taking a year off to work or do some kind of service, I think it would be great, it would be fantastic. And we can get rid of this delayed adulthood and try to work on that. <laughs> Wiser universities. Oh my gosh, this is so long. I'm already at 30 minutes. Jesus, mother. Accumulation and passing on of the truth is supposed to be what universities do. And of course, they are in dereliction of that duty nowadays and don't like that duty anymore. Now they're becoming activists instead of just trying to pass on the truth to students. Bringing about social change becomes the charge now, which is completely wrong. That is not what universities should be doing. They will be motivated in that space, and especially with the kinds of classrooms that we have at universities right now, they'll be motivated to do things and reach conclusions that are consistent with their ideologies, instead of being motivated to find out what's true. There's this idea of carpe datum, <laughs> seize the data <laughs> instead of seize the day. Carpe datum, I forget the author, she came up with that, but carpe datum should be much more important. Put search for truth first. That should be number one. Renew commitment to free speech. There's a Chicago statement. It's, I think it's the University of Chicago. And 40 colleges have adopted it, but it says it's they are going to protect free speech, period. 
openly and vigorously contest ideas. The practice of not responding to public outrage. 100% yes, thank you. Anytime there's public outrage about X or Y thing that was said on campus, I mean, obviously, if there's something else, I, <laughs> some kind of horrible violence or something, then respond to that. But if there's outrage about speech, don't respond to it. Don't give the public that kind of a uh, power. No heckler's veto. Don't allow it. A gap year, the new norm, as we talked about before. Pick students that have demonstrations of autonomy and who show intellectual virtues, uh, you know, like debate. Pick those students over other kinds of students. Include viewpoint diversity in diversity policies. You know, all of them have diversity policies. They should include viewpoint diversity as a very important protected thing that we need to make sure is part of the school experience. Orient and educate for disagreement. It's going to happen. It needs to happen. It's extremely healthy to engage with people who disagree with you. That should be something that universities are doing. Discourage the creep of unsafe to include feelings. <laughs> Don't let that concept creep from unsafe physically to include unsafe feelings. Don't let that happen. Challenge emotional thinking, for sure. Foster school spirit for common identity. Obviously, we need a common identity. It helps people congeal and be able to talk to each other as reasonable people. Protect physical safety, such as for students of color. And here, it was curious to me that there's no mention of Trump supporters. What are you more likely to be assaulted <laughs> if you are walking on a college campus nowadays? What is more likely that your property will be taken or damaged or you will be assaulted if you're walking around and happen to be of a different skin color or walking around and happen to be wearing a Make America Great Again hat? I think there's a very clear answer to that and host civil cross-party events for students. Very important. Make sure that they understand that people on the other side of the aisle, people who represent other ideas, are not demons. They are actual people. So Wiser Societies, expanding it a little bit here. We have Steven Pinker mentioned, who wrote the Better Angels of Our Nature book or whatever, who talked about it. in the long run, everything's getting better. Objectively, things are getting better when it comes to crime and poverty and all that stuff. Counter trends are going to rise up, according to the authors, that are going to buck against all all these kinds of trends that we've been seeing recently. Rethinking of identity politics, we just need to get rid of it in general, but there's got to be a rethinking. A common humanity, and then they reference Amy Chua, and I think we read one of her books that was absolutely horrendous, uh, but uh, they referenced one of her books. I, I can't remember in what context. I'm sure it was terrible, but it was, it was actually probably <laughs> a pretty good point. That particular point was probably pretty good. And the cognitive distortions, just to make sure that we have these things down. If you've got a pen, if you're on your phone, if you're on your computer, whatever, take this list down. It's nine. It's nine things. Make sure you've got this ready. If you're driving, just be careful. Don't actually do this, but uh, look it up later. They're the cognitive distortions, coddling of the American mind. So you've got one, emotional reasoning, two, catastrophizing, three, overgeneralizing, four, dichotomous thinking, five, mind reading, six, labeling, seven, negative filtering eight discounting positives and nine blaming hopefully you got those down you can use those the ones that are going to come up the most are probably emotional reasoning catastrophizing is a huge massive one people do that constantly online where they just say oh if you allow this thing then everything it's all gonna die we're all every all the worst things ever are going to happen or if you don't say this particular thing right now then you're denying the humanity of all people of this particular group yeah that's catastrophizing and that's the thing you see all the time Overgeneralizing that one straightforward obviously dichotomous thinking it's either that or this you know it's us versus them you're either good or evil. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. It's dichotomous thinking. Mind reading, where you you just pretend like you know what's going on in somebody else's brain. Labeling, it's just using labels broadly, like calling everybody Nazis, uh, and then saying you can beat up Nazis. Negative filtering, you see only the negative stuff. Discounting positives, you ignore all the positive stuff, and then blaming. It's everybody else's fault except yours. Okay, let's get into some analysis here. What kind of analysis do we have going on? So I looked at some reviews of the book. There's this one, The Idioms of Non-Argument by Connor Friedersdorf. Uh, I feel like the editor should have worked on that last name a little bit. But so Connor actually went through a number of reviews and reviewed the reviews and ran into this one. <laughs> yeah, he generally said that, you know, it's pretty well argued, it's pretty, pretty well put together, it's easy to follow, all that stuff, which I generally agree with those, uh, those assessments too. But there's this one particular review by this person in The Guardian, I think, that was 
titled The Coddling of the American Mind Review, How Elite U.S. Liberals Have Turned Rightwards. Now notice it's so funny because it goes right to identity. That's the whole point is the identity of the person. It's like if I can establish their identity as being this, then they lose. And that's, that's the way the brain is working in this context. So Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt's book sets out to rescue students from microaggressions and identity politics, but perhaps they merely resist change that might undermine them. Of course, that's not honestly a, a counterargument, and the the reviewer of the reviewer specifically talks about how that review has very little to say about substantive topics that are brought up here. It's mostly just attacking them ad hominem and just making broad assertions. So that reviewer goes on to say that display copy says, never mind the merits of the book's thesis. What's important here, fellow leftists, is where the author, the authors fall on left-right ideological spectrum and what psychological factors may be motivating them. What's a truth proposition when there's an ongoing culture war to fight? So that's what the, the reviewer of the reviewer was saying about that review, <laughs> is that it's really just about, okay, what's their identity, and that already does all the work for you. So in general, my analysis is an extremely useful framework for both understanding and treating our current situation, a lot of important ideas. CBT approach in general, it's safer, it has a lot of tools to be able to use, and it's very telling that they use so many of these distortions that come from CBT, and people who suffer the these kind of psychological ailments. They use so many of this, these distortions, obviously. It's really important to be able to po point this out. And importantly, I mean, the efforts to make children and students safer right now has the opposite effect. It's just like the peanuts. We're not producing psychologically healthy children. They don't know what they need. They don't know what they want. They're just doing whatever they're inclined to do. And they're not coming out psychologically healthy. So something's not working right. It's not about justice or progress. It's psychological impairment on display and we need to recognize this and deal with it appropriately. Of course, the book itself has clear liberal ensconcement, which is uh, somewhat of a problem. There was there were some clear biases, and they weren't particularly open about their biases, and they espouse some long debunked things, you know, that you hear amongst liberals that shouldn't be espoused in this kind of a book if they're trying to be, you know, on the level and honest about this stuff. They show some humility throughout as scientists, but they still draw some pretty massive conclusions uh, based on relatively limited evidence. However, it's much better than most, and the confluence of the strands of argument and evidence seem to dovetail very well and support each other pretty well too, so not much big criticism on that one. But liberals really need to get out of their own asses. Seriously, they just pretend to be virtuous while ignoring all the nuts and bolts kind of policy considerations. They need to stop trying so hard to, to show their virtue. Like, we really... that It doesn't give you anything. It doesn't give you any points. It doesn't help anything except, except to say, oh, look how empathetic I am, when empathy is not the best way to decide what policies are best. Anyway, so uh, big picture wise, all the kids are that are walking around hurling <laughs> verbal abuse at random restaurant goers that you see in these videos for not raising their fists in solidarity, these kids are not happy. They're not psychologically healthy. They don't really believe that they're in the civil rights moment of our time. They are empty and primarily socially comfortable, and they just are looking for anything to give them some kind of meaning. And a lot of this is explanatory of why that is. So we reasonable people, <laughs> if you're listening to this, you're obviously a reasonable, very intelligent, attractive, amazing person. We should be very aware of the cognitive distortions and challenge poor reasoning or complete lack of reasoning wherever we see it. So I'm going to keep this list of the cognitive distortions and try to use this CBT approach <laughs> to, to really be able to identify where people are going off the tracks. So anyway, so that's the, the second part, the second ridiculously bloated part of of the coddling of the American mind. It was a lot of fun to read. You know, I'd heard about it beforehand. It's 2018 is when it was published. I'd heard about it from people, but I didn't get to read it until now. And like I said, it has a lot of good ideas. So this is The Last Coffee House. If you like what I do, I do have a Patreon thing now. I'm not particularly sure with how any of that works, but it's there. The link's in the description, I think. But otherwise, we've got uh, so many, so many books, so many good books coming up soon, and so much information. We are seriously becoming the greatest of the great people. So I hope to see you on the next one. All right, bye. Bye. <music>